Well, hello, Hearth and Homies. Thanks for joining us for this compilation, The Adventures of Frank Race. This 30-minute program was syndicated from 1949 to 1952. Each show told the story of Frank Race, an attorney who traded his law books for the cloak and dagger of the OSS, and now adventure had become his business. I wonder if you get done with that. Anyway, Frank Race was played by Tom Collins, and Tony Barrett played his sidekick, Mark Donovan. For some of the actors you'll hear in this are Wilms Herbert, Frank Lovejoy, and many others. Now, Race has been described in various articles as a cross between James Bond and Johnny Dollar. This is our second compilation of the show, and uh, I really enjoyed it, and I hope you will too. And of course, we've taken this classic old-time radio show and paired it with some beautiful imagery to bring to you the OTR Visual Radio, a unique OTR viewing experience. Now, just before I tell you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the show, I do want to take a minute and tell you about the Johnny Dollar Club. Just to let you know, this channel is not monetized by YouTube, so we are totally dependent on viewers like you. Like, we're totally dependent on viewers like you. Uh, you, where are you? There you are. To keep this channel going. Now, YouTube is free, but it's an ad-supported platform, and many of your favorite YouTube channels receive revenue from ads to keep them going because it does take time and money to make a channel like this. But we're not part of the YouTube partner program anymore, but we're part of the Hearth and Home Entertainment Partner Program. That's right, the Johnny Dollar Club helps support the channel and it starts out for just a dollar a month. So for just a dollar a month, you keep the channel going and you also get access to exclusive content. So I hope you'll take a moment to click on the links below and check out the Johnny Dollar Club. See what level works for you and we really appreciate you taking the time to check it out. Now with that said, let's get on with the show. So sit back, relax, enjoy the show, and as always, thanks for tuning in. The Adventures of Frank Race, starring Tom Collins. Wow. The war changed many things, the face of the earth and the people on it. Before the war, Frank Race worked as an attorney, but he traded his law books for the cloak and dagger of the OSS. And when it was over, his former life was over too. Adventure had become his business. The Adventures of Frank Race. Join Frank Race for the adventure of the juvenile passenger. The evening had been a turkey. Following a dull dinner, I'd been collared by my hostess, a woman with about as much depth as a waiting pool. The conversation had been a three hour filibuster, with me effecting my escape only after a farewell scene that would have odorized any little theater in the land. So now I was settling into bed with a sigh of relief. The windows were open, the light was out. I could call it a... No. Yes? Well, about time you got home. Where you been? Well, let's not talk about that. What do you want? I'll be parking a cab in front of your place in about five minutes. Will you come down? For heaven's sakes, why? I got trouble, Race. I need your help. No, bring your trouble up here. I'm in bed. That's just it. I can't. You gotta come down, Race. I need you. Oh, uh... We'll make it ten minutes. This had better be good. So take a gander back there. Well, it's a girl. Yeah. And how old would you say she was? Fourteen, possibly. All right. She's fourteen and riding around in my cab at one o'clock in the morning. She ain't got the dough to pay a fare, and she says she'll kill herself if I don't keep driving her. Hmm. That ain't a ladle of trouble I'll put in with you. It'll do. What's your name, dear? I don't care to say. How long's she been riding with you, Ma? Since eleven o'clock. Well, how'd you happen to pick her up? I didn't. I step into a cafe for a few minutes to lap up a cup of coffee. When I come out, there she is, already in the cab. Hmm. I tried to head for a precinct house once, but she put the necks on it. She knows New York as well as I do. Well, let's all go for a ride. Drive around, Mark. I'll talk to her. You could tell me your first name. That wouldn't give anything away. It's Mary. 
<laughs> Look, no use being mad at me. I'm a stranger. I'm not mad. It's... <laughs> Trouble at home? I don't live at home. Relatives? I stay at an orphanage. Nothing wrong with that. No, there's nothing wrong with it except... Well, how would you like it if someone were trying to send you to jail? Someone at the orphanage? Just the head of it, that's all. No one can send you to jail if you haven't done anything wrong. She claims I steal things. I I don't, but... What's the use? You won't believe me either. I believe you. I'd like to help you. You can't do anything. Nobody can do anything. Well, what are you supposed to have stolen? Some jewelry. You like jewelry? Sure I like it. All girls do. But I didn't take any, even if they did find it in my mattress. Well, then tell them so. Well, let me take you back. No. Well, you can't keep riding around in this cab all night. Oh, nobody wants to help me. Nobody. I said I'll help you, and I will. <laughs> oh, forget about going back to the orphanage. But you must have friends, someone with whom you can spend the night. Then, tomorrow? I don't know anyone. Except Pharaoh Gillis. I'm afraid a man won't do. <sighs> Oh, Ferris Gillis is a lady. She's swell. She came to the orphanage a couple of times and told me to come and see her any time I wanted to. You know where she lives? We could find it in the phone book. We found it in the phone book. An apartment hotel in the 60s, a place called the Wellington Arms. Where the lady we sought seemed to be out. But we didn't exactly draw a blank. While we were still pushing the buzzer to her apartment on the second floor, the elevator clicked to a stop and three men got out. We drew their instant attention. Looking for somebody? He could have been the kid who takes your tickets to the theater. Skin was clear. He hadn't been shaving very long. He wore a bow tie and a pork pie hat, but his voice matched his eyes. And his eyes had all the warmth of wet pebbles. You heard me. You can turn off that look of inspection. I ain't liking it. We came to see Pharaoh Gillis. Who's a kid? Her name's Mary. Mary what? What difference does it make? It, it's all right. I'll tell him. It's Leonard. Mary Leonard. Reads like an act to me. Vinny, you and Lou take him down to the car. Fogel might want to look at him. I'll go through the apartment. You may as well all go through the apartment. The youngster and I are going down by ourselves. What are you trying to do? Act hard? I figure you ought to go downstairs with the boys. What do you want, a written invitation? I just want to be understood, clearly. I have an automatic in my pocket, and I'm gripping it. Take the elevator, Mary. Go down to the cab, tell Mark I may be able to use him. Scoop. All right. You don't think you're going to make me stick to you? I'm willing to try. What's the matter, Vinny? Need a smoke? Keep your hands where they are. You can wait. You know, I figure you do have an iron in that pocket. Clever of you. But I'm figuring something else, too. You didn't expect to run into us, either. Who'd want to? So I'm betting the iron ain't loaded. You go to a lot of trouble, don't you? Why don't you relax, boy? We're strangers. We've never seen each other before. If we just nod, go our respective ways, we'll both stay happy. Now I'm sure you ain't got that gun loaded. He had me. And here was a boy who plainly liked violence for its own sake. There's nothing left for me but the stairwell, so I vaulted the banister and... Get... Got a decent fall. Hey, what goes? I was just coming up. Come in. Let's go. Where to? Not to that orphanage. This youngster's taking up enough of our time tonight. There were cars parked in front of the orphanage, and lights still on inside. In the office, a sort of conference seemed to have taken place. But we got an instantaneous reaction from a woman of about 50, a woman whose face suggested that she wanted no fun out of life and resented anyone else trying for it. Well, just where have you been, young lady? Who is this, Mary? Mrs. Barkley. She's head matron. Good evening, Mrs. Barkley. Well? My name's Race. I'm a private investigator. I'm acting on this young lady's behalf. Gosh. You are, are you? Well, I'll have you know... Uh, pardon me, Mrs. Barkley. And where did you find this girl, Mr. Race? I have a friend who drives a taxi. Mary was one of his fares tonight. And she seemed upset and he found a problem. So he called on me. I see. I don't believe we've met. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Paul Westerhaven. This is Miss Doris Sanford. Possibly you know Winthrop Gravel. Everyone does. Paul Westerhaven. 
Plays polo the way Stan Musial plays baseball. Horses and money. Plenty of both. Doris Sanford I had never seen before. A definite loss on my part. She was lovely even under the glare of a light that gave Mrs. Barclay's face the look of a boiled potato. If you were any kind of a sharpshooter, Winthrop Gravel was a name to flinch at. He scribed a hard-hitting newspaper column that went in for reform. You might be interested to know, Race, that we're here because of this girl's disappearance. She's utterly incorrigible. We've been able to do absolutely nothing with her. You ever try being kind? Oh. Well, it is somewhat of a problem, Race. This is the second time the girl has run off. We've been fortunate that no bad publicity has developed. Now, where does Pharaoh Gillis fit into the picture? Oh, that woman. Who is Pharaoh Gillis? Well, she's rather well-known, Paul. Operates as a gambler. As far as I'm concerned, she's a pretender and a liar. Why do you have that opinion? A month or so ago, Miss Gillis promised to donate the cost of a new building to the orphanage. She seemed quite enthusiastic at the time, but nothing came of it. Well, if you don't mind, we're going to say goodnight. I'll come and see you tomorrow, Mary. We'll talk this over. All right. And if I've seemed abrupt, Mrs. Barclay, I apologize. I don't imagine your job is a breeze by any means. <clears throat> Certainly isn't. Next morning, I went back to the apartment hotel that housed Pharaoh Gillis. The manager, a pink-skinned man with a mouth that puckered as he talked, was still agog over the shot that had been fired the night before, but didn't connect me with it. When I mentioned Pharaoh Gillis, he puckered and shook his head. Uh, no, uh, she hasn't been here for a week. Uh, she often goes away like that, but never tells us where. Oh, no anyone else who might know where she is? Uh, no one. She's a very strange woman. Gambles, you know. How about her lawyer? I don't believe she has one. You know where she banks? She doesn't. I know that for a fact. Everything in cash with Miss Gillis. It's an idiosyncrasy of hers. Always carries cash. It pays us in cash. Pays everyone in cash. It must be her gambling instinct. You're quite like me. Well... Thanks. Oh, that's all right, Mr. Racer. Uh, didn't you say you were an investigator? Yes. Well, I, I'm always willing to help investigators. Always. The house in which Doris Sanford lived had the look that spells lots of family background. The size that spells money. I was curious to know if Miss Sanford would appear as lovely by daylight as she had the night before. She did. And then some. I can say one thing. You don't look as grim as you did last night. It was a rough evening. <laughs> you care for a drink? Well, it was a little early. I'd rather wait. Well, you have a charming house. Makes a nice frame for you. You couldn't pay me a nicer compliment. Oh, you? yes, I could. It was just a warm-up shot. You know, you couldn't have looked grim last night. Now, speaking of the orphanage, <laughs> I've just come from there. I had a talk with a kid. She isn't very happy. I know. We've got to do something for her. How about that Barclay lady? Oh, she's all right. She lost her sister last month, and they were very close. She's making a bit of an adjustment. She'll get over it. She seems to be adjusting at the expense of that kid. How does a woman like Pharaoh Gillis tie in with the orphanage? Well, it seems that she stayed there as a child. She comes in every once in a while for a visit. You know, this building she was going to have to write, how much was it going to cost? $50,000. Nice bundle of money. Yes, it is. But you can see Mrs. Barclay's side of it. She was pretty excited at the prospect. But that drink you mentioned, uh, couldn't we have it somewhere tonight? And dinner to go with her? That sounds as though it might be fun. But... But you have another engagement. I could break it. Couldn't I? <laughs> I like the way you say that. Will you call for me? With my hair combed and my face a shine. <laughs> All right, Ray. It's a date. <laughs> What have you been doing, Chop? Oh, hello, Mike. I didn't know you were here. Well, after last night, I thought you'd be home early, so I came up. What'd you buy? A black felt hat for evening wear. I thought you had one of them. I do. But when I pulled it out today, I found a bullet hole in it. Huh? wonder where you got that. Hey, uh, a guy called about 15 minutes ago. A fellow by the name of Tully. Tully? Yeah. Oh, he's the uh, manager of the Wellington Arms. Yeah, that's the one. Said to tell you Pharaoh Gillis is back. Does that sound important? It might be. I've still got a couple of free hours, Mark. Uh, drive me over there, will you? I 
I found the door to the apartment slightly ajar, so I knocked. I thought I heard a voice say, come in, so I did. She was reclining on a divan, a woman of perhaps 60. She had a theatrical look. Her skin was heavy with makeup, her hair tinted a flamboyant red. She was smiling at me, and the set of her features indicated that she was used to smiling. There was only one thing wrong with the picture. Someone had stabbed a knife into her chest. She was dead. We'll return to the adventures of Frank Grace in just about one minute. Back to the adventures of Frank Grace. Finding someone murdered always presents one serious problem. Should you notify the police? If you do, you're going to find yourself involved. If you don't, you may find yourself even more involved. But this time, I didn't have to carry out my decision. Just as I picked up the phone, a voice spoke to me in the same soft tones that had invited me into the room. I wouldn't do that if I were you. He'd stepped out from behind a bookcase partition, and dapper serves as a one-word description. He'd have been something from a style page in Esquire, even had the leer to go with it. With him was Slate, the lad who had caused me to vault into the stairwell. The hood called Vinny was also along. I'm Johnny Fogel. The lady is a friend of mine. If we're going to discuss the lady, we may as well get into the past tense, don't you think? Ah, you see, Johnny, you're sugar cookie, like I told you. You ain't going to get nowhere with him unless you raise a few lumps on him first. Were you a friend of the lady? To my knowledge, this is the first time I've ever laid eyes on her. Maybe I should have said the lady was a partner of mine. I understand she was in an interesting business. The most interesting business there is. A few weeks ago, she made a killing, a real big killing. Yeah? I gave her the tip that clicked for her, so I sort of figure that now she's gone. Lord rest her soul. I'm straight in line to be the heir to what she left behind. I suppose that's a logical pattern of reasoning for a person of your temperament. Talk so Johnny can get what you mean. Never mind, Slate. I get what he means. And I think he gets what I mean. Let's not waste each other's time for... Don't reach for that phone, pal. You ain't gonna call nobody. Frisk him, Slate. Uh, I wouldn't worry none, Johnny. He's got a gun, but it's never loaded. I'd take it just the same and keep it for you, John. You see, Race? It's like this. You coming in here made it kind of embarrassing. A little embarrassing for us, more embarrassing for you. Because it ain't gonna be sensible for me to let you go walking out, is it? You want something, Fogel? What is it? Pharaoh's dough. I happen to know she was healed with better than 50 grand. And by the way, every drawer in the apartment seemed to have been so neatly emptied, I'd say you'd been looking for it. Pharaoh wouldn't have been keeping the dough here. She wasn't that kind. I haven't the slightest idea what Pharaoh Gillis was like. You may as well know that I can't tell you a thing about her money. Uh, that's the trouble with you guys. You always want to play a lone hand. Let's get him out of here, Slate. Start moving, Race. And this time you ain't getting away with no phony moves. The Slate pushed me past the door. Fogel lingered for a last look at Ferro Gillis, which meant that Slate and I started downstairs by ourselves. He insisted on walking right behind me, so after about six steps, I simply sat down in front of him. He instantly went over me and... <laughs> crashed on the landing below. I leaped after him, but there was only time to regain my pistol before Fogel appeared at the top of the stairs. Drop that gun, Race! I went the rest of the way on the run, past a gaping manager in the foyer, up to a gaping Mark Donovan at curbside. Oh, not again. Every time you go in that place, you get chased out by bullets. Get me home in a hurry, Mark. I'm due to pick up a most attractive girl in less than 30 minutes. <laughs> Candlelight. Why? I might have known you'd do it this way, Race. I couldn't think of you in any other surroundings. Not at this time, anyway. You're nice. You're beautiful. Tell me something. Ask it. 
Each time I've seen you, you've worn black. It's for my father. He died less than a year ago. I'm sorry. You don't have to be. You're observant. I like that. It's flattering. In fact, I seem to like everything about you, Race. What would you like to do after dinner? Go home. The butler will have the fire going. I thought we could just talk. Fire was going, as she'd promised. And for the first time in years, I munched freshly roasted popcorn dripping with butter. I love this house, Race. My father left me a fortune, but out of everything, I think I appreciate this house the most. This house and all the things that go with it. Look, these are some linens my mother received when she was married. Aren't they beautiful? She looked unbelievably lovely in the firelight. She gracefully showed me the fabrics, then carefully folded them, placed them on a nearby table. There. It's the last one. Now it's your turn. What would you like to do? Take you in my arms. You think that's going to be hard? Might be complications. You know, you show signs of being a very domestic young lady. Why don't you kiss me? You'll find I have other qualities, too. <clears throat> I beg pardon, Miss Smith. Uh, Mr. Graver will see you. I'm just going to barge in, Doris. I, uh... Oh, I didn't know you had company. It's Mr. Race. You remember Winthrop? You met him last night. Oh, yes, yes. Of course I remember. Uh, I came to see you about that youngster. She's been arrested, Doris. Arrested? Mary Leonard? Well, it seems that Mrs. Barkley made a report to the police about the missing jewelry Oh, and... no. We'll have to run down and get the child out. Well, I'm afraid they don't grant bail on a murder charge. Murder? Murder. One of the items the police recovered from the girl was a diamond earring. The make to it was found today in the apartment of Pharaoh Gillis along with Miss Gillis's body. So it seems that the orphanage has been harboring a juvenile murderess. I saw Mary Leonard the next morning. She had no tears for me. She was terribly quiet, terribly white. I told you no one could do anything for me. Didn't I, Mr. Wraith? Well, I haven't been able to do much, have I, Mary? But I want you to know that I've got an idea about this affair. It's just an idea... And a pretty hazy one at that. But it might lead somewhere. I'll keep in touch with you. For the rest of the day, I had Mark out gathering information while I busied myself doing the same thing. We got together at five o'clock. Hey, you know something you were right about that Gillis thing? She flipped the around like nothing. And the more I she give away... I... <laughs> I should have known that lady. Did you visit Mary Leonard? Yeah, yeah. I saw the kid. Yeah, Ray, she's scared. She's really scared. They're going to have to let the newspapers in on a deal unless you turn up some. It was about an hour later that I got a call from Doris Sanford. Race, can you come to see me right away? It's important. Trouble? Well, in a way, nothing to do with the orphanage, but it does concern us. Well, let me see. I'm expecting a report on something, but I know what I'll do. I'll call and tell them to get in touch with me at your place. I'll be right over. It's Winthrop Grable Race. He thinks he's in love with me, and he's become insanely jealous of you. We can't have that, can we? After all, he's a big boy now. But he can hurt you with that column of his. There's a phone call from Mr. Race, Miss Sanford. I took it in the library. It was the report I'd been waiting for. When I got back to Doris, I found Winthrop Grable with her. He greeted me with a frigid nod. His face was flushed, but his eyes had a too bright look. Was it the call you've been expecting, Race? Yes. It seems that Pharaoh Gillis not only made a promise to give $50,000 to the orphanage, but she actually delivered the money. What are you talking about? Pharaoh Gillis always did everything with cash. And that's the way it was handed over. 50000 in United States currency. I guess it was too much for the party who accepted it, because nothing was ever said about it. And that's why Pharaoh Gillis was murdered. So where do we go from there? To the fact that Pharaoh Gillis wasn't murdered just to keep her silent. Drawers and cupboards had been emptied in the apartment. 
She'd evidently obtained a receipt for the money which the killer wanted and got, I believe. <laughs> and I suppose you know all about the killer's identity, eh? I do know. Who did it, Race? You did, darling. Uh, I got my lead on that from the way you folded those linens last night. The way I folded the linens? So carefully, so meticulously. The same way everything was handled in Pharaoh Gillis' apartment. You were disturbed before you could put the things back. But you left everything so neatly piled. You're being ridiculous, Race. I just inherited a fortune from my father. I know. But this afternoon I learned that it wasn't a very liquid fortune. Not much money. So inheritance taxes were going to cripple you. Make you sacrifice a big slice of your holdings. I think the courts will accept that as a pretty good motive. You're wrong, Race. No, I'm not. The item I particularly don't like is the way you set that little girl up for a patsy. Framing her with some frowsy jewelry. Planting the stuff so she'd not only be suspected of thievery, but of murder as well. When this man is trying to frame me. Yes, but he's not going to get away with it. Put that gun away, Gravel. She's making a fool of you. No, you've been trying to make a fool of me. Making passes at her when you knew she was engaged to me. But it's the last pass you'll make at any woman. Why, you... Sorry, Gravel. I can only allow you one miss. Oh! Yes. Yes, dear. I've been thinking of taking a trip to Lake Louise. Why don't you come with me? After all, you can't prove I did anything. That receipt is no longer in existence. Nor the duplicate. I know. But you wrote pretty heavily when you made it out. Heavily enough to mark up the blank underneath. That was what my report was about. The police lab was able to show it all up. The amount and your signature. And you can put down that poker, darling, before I forget I'm a gentleman. The Adventures of Frank Race, starring Tom Collins. The war changed many things the face of the earth and the people on it. Before the war, Frank Race worked as an attorney, but he traded his law books for the cloak and dagger of the OSS. And when it was over, his former life was over too. Adventure had become his business. The Adventures of Frank Race. Join Frank Race for The Adventure of the Reckless Daughter. Night brooded over the city, and its streets seemed quiet. But you could sense the bitterness that lay beneath the apparently placid surface. This was a section of the European continent, and here the scars of war showed jagged and ugly, with a healing, not a happy process. Oh, brother. Talk about dead towns. Everybody here must be between the quilts. It's almost midnight. That's late? In New York, things are just be getting started. I'm afraid it's different here, Mark. Yeah, I'll say it's different. Every guy you meet gives you the door guy. They all seem to think that no matter what... Oh, brother, they come kind of close. Listen. Hey, I say this town was dead. I'm now munching on my white. Well... Now with you standing here, let's go. Look, what are we doing in this town, Race? You never did get around to telling me. I don't know what the job is yet. You have to see a man by the name of McDonald. And well, I can see that there's no... Hey, that one just about took off my ear. Stay back against this wall. Then you're in the shadow. Look, what goes here, anyway? Wait a second. I thought I heard someone call. Americans, you can come here. Hey, it's a dame. A doorway over there. Come on. Maybe. Yes. And thanks for the suggestion. Oh, I could not leave you there, could I? Not when those bullets are really meant for me. Yeah, who's on the other side of them? Probably the police. Cops? <laughs> you leave us not stay here. There's no future in it. Let's... Uh... Well, there doesn't seem much future out here, either. Police throwing lead. If they are the police. Oh, you don't believe me. Yeah, I wish it weren't so dark. 
But the rest of it goes with that voice. We must not strike a light. We would draw the fire. Which uh, brings up the question of getting out of here. There is a little cafe in the next square. We could perhaps make a break for it. Well, not all of us together, but I have an idea. Which way is the cafe? To our right. Then I'll make a dash to the left, while you and my friend here leg it for the cafe. We'll meet there. Look, let me do the solo act, Grace. You stay with the lady, huh? No sale. It was my thought. Yeah, but I'm used to driving a cab, which makes me better at dodging things. Go ahead, get going. I'll see you later. He was gone before I could protest, with two shots reaching out for him as the girl and I took the other direction. The cafe in the next block turned out to be pretty much like the rest of the city. Not much light, not much glitter. Very little sound. Well, do I match my voice? You witch. You knew you'd knock me over, didn't you? <laughs> you were sure of it. I'm surprised, too. Very pleasantly surprised. Red hair and brown eyes and all the accessories. And I mean all of them. <laughs> A woman at whom someone fires bullets. Remember? You're gay. You laugh when so many of these around are grim and unsmiling. Why? To waste life on anything but laughter is foolish. Who are you? Stephanie. Just Stephanie? That seems to be it. Would it do me any good to ask you the why of the bullets? Not at the moment, because we're going to be intruded upon... I object to that word, Stephanie. You make it sound too personal. He had the look that spelled bloodhound. And I sensed that because of the girl, he was going to be my enemy. Grace, this is Gregor Savas. Won't you sit down? You will pardon me if I do not. Sit down, Gregor. It will ease that temper of yours. You uh, have a companion, I believe, Mr. Race. Yes, I... What happened? He is quite all right. But we will have to charge him with resisting arrest. Now you know, Race. Sebas is a policeman. A highly placed policeman, to be sure, but a policeman, nevertheless. Gregor, do sit down and have something to drink with us. It will lighten your spirits. I am not anxious to lighten my spirits. There are other things to think about. Sebas, if Mark Donovan's guilty of anything... Then I am equally so. And I. If I thought I could make use of such a situation, believe me, I would. Your companion was guilty of physical resistance. In this country, that is serious. In this country, everything is serious. Let the man go, Gregor. He was only trying to help me. If I have my way, and I think I will, he shall pay a full penalty. And that, for your information, Mr. Race... Is quite severe. This was his parting shot. With it, he left us, pausing only a moment or so to say something to a man beside the door. I'm sorry, Race. I'd better start doing something about Mark. Oh, of course. I wish I could help. Will I see you again? Why not? I'm staying with a friend, a countrywoman of yours. Find the church of San Sebastian and walk through its graveyard. Unusual directions. <laughs> Geraldine Carr is an unusual woman. I'm very fond of her. I headed for the door, but halfway there I got my eye full of trouble. The lad to whom Savas had spoken had a knife in his hand. So I jammed my way past a side door and into a small room that offered exit in the shape of a window already open. I went through this and landed on the pavement outside. <laughs> I told Mark that we'd come to the city to see a man by the name of MacDonald. And it was to this person that I went now. It was after midnight, but I found him still up, reading the latest blurb on the condition of Europe. Oh, I never seem to sleep well in a hotel. Silly, isn't it? No, sit down, Race. I came to this hour because I have a friend who's just been thrown in jail on a petty charge. I thought you might be able to help us. How long is it since you arrived? About nine hours. Nine hours, and you already have a problem. Mm, problem. This country is full of them. I know I'm in business here. I could probably do something for your friend. I'm wondering if you can do something for me. I'll try. I want to trigger a big expansion program here, Race. My syndicate is willing to spend millions because we know the industrial record of this nation. It's great. Naturally, to keep such a development sound, we must have insurance. But the underwriters are balking. Too much instability of government. Too many factions cross purposes. Well, I can imagine that. You sense it just from walking the streets of the city. 
There's one man who ties a nation together. He's done it before. He can do it again. Anton Vendine. Yes, you know him. It's largely because you know him that you're here. Now, if we can persuade Vendine to again become prime minister, the insurance companies are willing to restore protection to business. That's the most important thing that can happen to this country. I want you to talk to Vendine, Race. I want you to persuade him to accept the post the people want him to take. If he'll say yes, President Leto will appoint him tomorrow. Well, I'm surprised that he hasn't already accepted. What's the impasse? Well, for some reason, he's become a recluse. Won't talk to anyone. That's why your name was mentioned, you know. I understand you once held a cellar with him, kept a full detachment of Nazis at bay for almost two days. Yes. Well, he's a lion, that Lindy. Ah, uh, yes. Say nothing of yourself. Will you see him? Yeah, as early as possible, tomorrow. I found Anton Vendine working in his garden. I remembered him with dark, gray-streaked hair. Now his hair was almost white. But the look of him was the same. Rugged, fighting features and the eyes of a child running to receive a toy. His eyes had always carried that expression, even in battle. Grace, I can't believe it. <laughs> I'm so happy to see you. Well, it seems a long time, Anton. Yes, a long time. We saw some hectic days, didn't we? And now, <laughs> I cultivate roses. Anton, we've always been strong friends. We've always been frank with one another. I can recall that with pleasure. So you can understand why I'm puzzled. The people of this country want you for their prime minister. The post has been vacant for weeks, waiting for your acceptance. Politics. <laughs> I no longer have an interest there, Ace. Well, in your case, I prefer the word statesmanship. In my case, it's all the same. There's something else bothering you. No man could change this much in five or six years. Yes, there is something else. Do you remember my daughter? You must. In 43, she was 17. Yes, I remember. I recall that you were very close to each other. Yes, we were close, weren't we? She was not only a daughter. She was a companion in arms. A child to make a man proud of himself. Anton, has something happened to her? I thought I had done all the proper things with my daughter. Psychologically, educationally. She saw some very bad times, like the rest of us. But I felt her to be sound inside. I've always admired the women of my country race. Admired them for their strength and vitality. My daughter has both of those attributes in abundance. And now she insists on turning them to the pursuits of vandalism and violence. Uh, philosophy she thinks is new and different. Be gay and seek enjoyment no matter what the cost to others. This has become her only aim in life. I see. But you can't let this affect you, Anton. You can't... Grace... When a man cannot influence his own child, a girl to whom he has given all his talents, the best of his efforts, how can he expect to lead a nation? Anton, if my memory serves me correctly, your daughter's name is Stephanie. That's right, Race. And she was always very fond of you. And if my memory serves me still further, Stephanie has red hair. Stephanie Vendine. No wonder I hadn't recognized her. I remember what she'd been like five years before, thin from lack of nutrition. A young girl who seemed all eyes. She'd changed, and how she'd changed. I kept walking. The thought of Stephanie Vendine's beauty couldn't quite dispel the feeling of depression I developed in talking to her father. It was because of my preoccupation, I didn't notice the car until I'd almost reached it. It was stopped so as to block my passage across the intersection. There was the driver, a man sitting in back. Another man stood alongside the car, leaning slightly on a cane. Mr. Race. So us. You may be interested to know that your companion was set free about an hour ago through the request of a rather influential person. Oh, that's gratifying. I resent meddling, particularly on the part of foreigners. And I consider you and your companion to be a disturbing influence here. 
So I am making a suggestion. Get out of the country. If you remain here after noon tomorrow, either of you, you will be haunted down and shot. <laughs> Return to the adventures of Frank Race in just about one minute. And now back to the adventures of Frank Race. The overall picture had become clearer now. The country had turned within itself out of dissatisfaction, and the Corps was assuming the old pattern, dictatorship. Already it had become a semi-police state. There was a possibility that Savas had the drive to make it his party, the flame that would twist the country into his grip. There was only one remedy. Anton Vendine must return to the post of Prime Minister, which meant that I had to see his daughter. Uh, I think we could have got here a little faster. We could have done a looking by daylight. Uh, this must be it. You set a church on one side and a graveyard on the other, didn't you? No, this is it, all right. And we go through the graveyard in the dark. Oh, I'm proud of routine. The girl is living with Bohemians. I thought you said she was staying with an American, Dan. And by Bohemian, Mark, I mean Artie. Well, they like to do things in an unusual way. Well, they're doing it. What's the matter with that flashlight? Seems to be getting dim. When you go walking through a graveyard at night, you... Hey, Mark. Where are you? Here I am, Race. The bottom of this pit. Well, his light went out. Must be the batteries. Wait a second. Ah, oh, there it is. Ah. Oh. <laughs> well, I'll be darned. <laughs> what are you laughing at? It's a lucky thing I didn't break my neck. What is this, anyhow? Marcus, you're in a grave. I'm in a what? <laughs> you're kidding? An open grave. <laughs> yes, me. That's Russian thing, you little. Yeah, let me help you out, huh? You have to reach <laughs> way in. They bury him deep in this country. Here, grab. <laughs> I got it. All right, now dig in with your feet. Yeah, that's it. There we go. Oh, yeah. oh. oh that does it. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Now let's see if we can find those women without any more mishaps. Huh? Place turned out to be the loft over a barn, but a loft that had been decorated quite fetchingly. We found no one there, but a note had been tagged at the door. Note asking any callers to go in and wait. Very cozy. I never would have thought it. Look, what's the pitch on all this, Razor? A beautiful girl who thinks that tearing around and involving herself in madcap escapades is fun. Even though it threatens to ruin her father's career. Ah, uh, dames. And when they're beautiful, it makes it all the tougher. Oh, huh? you sound so cynical, the pair of you. Well, hello, Stephanie. Hey, where'd you come from? Oh, we have a back door, too. Hello, Race. Why didn't you tell me who you really were? Oh, you've seen my father. Yes, I saw him. I couldn't resist it, Race. I was so mad about you when you were here before. I was only 16 then. Remember? I remember a girl who could think of nothing but her country's freedom. A girl who adored her father. I adored you too, Race. I think I could still adore you. With a little encouragement. <clears throat> uh, uh, maybe I ought to stroll down by the graveyard and commune with the spirits. Not on my account, Mark. Oh, meaning you have no such romantic inclination. Is that it, Race? Stephanie, why do you insist on placing your father in such a bad position? You mean because I refuse to wave the flag any longer? Maybe I suffered from war nerves too? Maybe I want a little fun. From what I gather, your fun gets pretty rough. Vandalism. It'd be quite a crowd you're traveling with. I like them. They know how to live. All I ever really knew before I met them was how to die. Oh, this is probably Geraldine now. Huh. And Ted. Oh, darling, we missed you. I thought... Oh, I'm sorry. Why? Because she's got another man here? Well, I'm not sorry. He's too good looking. This must be your other American, Stephanie. Oh, not as much my American as I had hoped. Race, this is Geraldine Carr and Ted Lamson. 
Ted Lampson looked like all America in 1948. His slacks and shoes had been yellowed by mud, but his attitude was completely casual. Geraldine Carr had the look of a nightclub hostess and the attitude to go with it. You mean he's given you trouble, Ducky? Oh, he thinks I'm being a silly, willful female. Why, Race? Because she refuses to moan about the probability of the next war? Because she's sensible enough to know that heaven funds the most important thing in life? That's quite a breezy philosophy. Good thing it hasn't been the creed of all mankind. And why not? We'd still be peering out of caves. It's our idea that you could be happy and still do things, Race. Oh, I understand you do things, all right. Not very constructive, though, are they? Do come in, Gregor, even without knocking. I am not your socially, Stephanie. This time my visit is official. Then I'm sure it concerns me. I am sure it concerns you, my dear. The Church of San Sebastian has just been robbed, and the custodian murdered. Murdered? His body is lying in the graveyard at this moment with a knife in its side. What was taken, Savas? A gold statue worth a lot of money. Gregor, if you think I had anything to do with this... What else can I think? The way you have been acting, the things you have been doing... The things I've been doing have never included thievery or murder. I'm sorry, Stephanie. I must place you under arrest. Race. Mr. Race is leaving the country. He has less than 24 hours. I trust he is keeping that in mind. I could think of nothing else but to head for the home of Anton Vendine, where the immediate reaction to my news was one of hopelessness. You see, Race? This finishes it. I can see it'll finish a lot of things if we don't act quickly, including the freedom of this country. What are the mechanics of your taking over the premiership? Well, I could simply be sworn in at any time. But... With what has happened, I'm afraid the president will no longer be considering my appointment. Let's go to him, Anton, before it's too late. <laughs> president Lator, a gray little man with furrows of trouble etched across his forehead, shook his head dubiously. The papers all have it by now, Anton. I, I am afraid the feeling is going to run high. Yesterday, you were the hero of the people. Tomorrow... They may think of you only as the father of a murderer. Uh, under the circumstances... I, I understand. Uh, will you excuse me, General? He left us to answer his phone. When he came back, his expression looked even more troubled than before. What is it, Nikolai? Gregor Savas. He insists that I summon him to the post of Prime Minister. If you do, Mr. President, it'll be a move you'll gravely regret. I'm afraid I'm going to have no other alternative. I have held the post open too long as it is, waiting for you, Anton. And Mr. Van Dien's ready to accept it. But this is a scandal, Race. We may as well give up. We are a religious people, Mr. Race, and uh, that statue had great importance to us. Suppose we find it. Suppose we prove that Stephanie Van Dien had nothing to do with its theft. Oh, I should be most happy. Then I'd like you two gentlemen to meet me at the side entrance to the Church of San Sebastian in about an hour. I think I know where to find that statue. See anyone yet, Mark? Nah, nobody. But it's a good thing that moon come out behind those clouds. They wouldn't be able to see nothing. You, uh, you want the president and Mr. Van Dane to come first, don't you? Yes. And if I have time to write, that's the way it'll work. If I have time to write. There's so much that can go wrong with this, Mark. Hey, here comes a couple of guys now, right? Yeah, let me look. The ones you want? Yes. It's the president, Anton Van Dien. We're in this doorway, gentlemen. Uh, all right, Race. Oh, Mr. Race, whatever you are going to do, you must do it quickly. I have only a short time in which to make a decision. If I have time to drive, Mr. President, you shouldn't have too long to wait. In fact, there's someone now. Where? Coming through the graveyard. Who is it, Race? A countryman of mine, I'm ashamed to say. Oh, but something's wrong. He should have had company. He's gone. One moment he was there, and now he's gone. Come on. All right, Lamson. 
You can stop digging. Come out of there. Grace. That is the one, all right. Same grave I fell into. Climb out, Lampson. But, but this is nothing but an empty grave. Not entirely empty, Mr. President. Buried at the bottom of it, you'll find that stolen statue. Morty Lampson. You sneak. You trapped me into coming out here. Don't talk about sneaks, Lampson. You've been letting Stephanie Van Deen think you were a friend. Well, you won't get away with it. I'm not alone in this. I... Go ahead, Lampson. Tell us who else is in it with you. I think I can answer that best, Grace. Save us. Yes, save us. And with this, there's a present for all of you. Save us. I'm in here, too. Watch out for me. You are a bungling tool. You are going to die with the rest of them. He means it. He's going to kill me, too. There seems to be others with him. Surely. Savas is set right now to make his first push. Yeah, with us is the kind Goslins. Wait. Let's give them something back. Ah! Mr. Race, what, what is going on here? I'm afraid our friend Savas intends to assume control of this country. To do that, he knew he'd have to discredit Anton Van Deen. So he took advantage of Stephanie's apparent waywardness and framed this theft and murder. That's the way of it, isn't it, Lamson? Yes. Yes, that's the way of it. Yeah, he'd have made it stick, too. Mark Donovan hadn't fallen into this grave. Oh, it looks as though he may win even so. Yeah, they're pinning us down while they come closer. Yeah, they, it's just a matter of time. Just a matter of time. You let them come closer. I welcome it. You know, I still can't see how you figured this one out, Rich. You notice this grave now, Mark? It's just about six feet deep, isn't it? Yeah, but when I fell into it, it was a lot deeper. Six feet has always been the proper depth for a grave. But if you wanted to hide something in it, you'd make it deeper, wouldn't you? Which they did. They went right down to the yellow soil that Lampson had on his shoes. Race, I think they're coming. We're coming, all right! Stand back a moment, Race! Race! Oh, brother. What was that? Anton, you wiped them out with a hand grenade. We did it once before, Race. Remember? Against the same kind of people. Let's get out of here, Anton. So we can have you sworn in as prime minister. For the second time, you burned it. Adventures of Frank Race, starring Tom Collins with Tony Barrett as Mark Donovan, comes to you from Hollywood. Others heard in tonight's cast were Gene Bates, Evelyn Scott, Jack Crucian, Wilms Herbert, Joe Duvall, and Harry Lang. This series is written and directed by Buckley Angel and Joel Murcott. The music is composed and played by Ivan Dittmars. Be sure to be with us again this same time next week for another dramatic chapter in The Adventures of Frank Race. Art Gilmore speaking. This is a Bruce Ells production. The Adventures of Frank Race, starring Tom Collins. The war changed many things, the face of the earth and the people on it. Before the war, Frank Race worked as an attorney but he traded his law books for the cloak and dagger of the OSS. And when it was over, his former life was over too. Adventure had become his business. The Adventures of Frank Race. Join Frank Race for The Adventure of the Silent Heart. It was hot in New York. One of those summer days when the newspaper sent cameramen on the prowl for some citizen sufficiently touched with the sun to try frying an egg in the sidewalk. At the moment, I felt like the egg. But coming out of the furnace blast of the street into the air-cooled offices of Trans-Columbia Life Plan... It was like passing from this veil of tears into some unexpected Valhalla. Oh, 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 ain't this something? Say, are all offices like this, Race? No wonder secretaries look so fresh at five o'clock. In the reports, you look pretty fresh to secretaries too, Mark. At all hours. Eh, stop with it, Carl. 
Look, uh, who is this guy that you're going to see? Fred Jeremy. There's his name right there in the door. Well, why don't I go in with you? Maybe the guy's got something cool in a glass to go with the cool air. You know? He probably wants to see me alone, Mark. Can I help you? Uh, my name's Race. I'd like to see Mr. Jeremy. Oh, well, go right in, Mr. Race. You're expected. Uh, Race? I think I'll wait out here after all. Mark, someday they'll pass a law making cab drivers wear blinkers. It'll be rough on you, boy. Rough. <laughs> take your time in there. I will. You take your time out here. Yeah. Hey, look, baby. I know a place where there is a tree piece band and I action. hate dancing. Yeah, hey, Mark. Yeah. You try not to freeze to death while I'm gone, huh? Fred Jeremy. Thick lensed glasses and high forehead. You had the look of the kid who sat next to you in school, the one who turned in his arithmetic paper 20 minutes before you finished yours. The moment his eyes were glued in some charts hanging on the wall. Know anything about graphs, Race? A little. Oh. Take a look at these. Statistics on angina pectoris, heart disease. This one represents the national average of deaths due to heart ailments. Oh, it looks pretty high. It is, Race. It's a big killer. And what's the other chart? That represents one county in our New England district. Same disease? Yes, Race, the same disease. But notice the sharp upswing in deaths during the past year. Almost doubles the national average. Yes. Of course, it could be a coincidence. But you don't think so? Obviously not, or I wouldn't have sent for you. Race, I think there's a murder ring operating in that county. Any special pattern that the claims follow? Yes. The majority of the claims have been paid to business partners. Uh, look at this latest one. The deceased, Richard Dodge, was insured for $50,000 by the financing partner, Arthur Becker. Mm -hmm. But Becker's original investment in the business was only $8,000. I'd like to have a copy of that report. Yeah, there's one in this folder, along with a list of other cases that are suspiciously similar. Race, the town of Midville is situated on a lake right near the center of that county. It's uh, rather popular as a vacation resort. You could... Uh, Use a vacation, couldn't you? I'll leave tonight. I'll let you know where I'm staying. Oh, ho, ho, brother, what a layout. <laughs> now, this is living race. And did you see those gorgeous chicks down by the lake? <laughs> I am going to like it here. Yeah, be careful of your heart, Mark. This place is becoming noted for angina pectoris. Yeah? You know anybody who can introduce us to the day? Well, this is one you wouldn't enjoy meeting. Come on, let's climb into some swim trunks. Huh? <laughs> that is exactly what I had in mind. Come in. Mr. Race? That's right. My name is Arthur Becker. He was a fat man. But the way he carried himself told me that muscles were hidden under those layers of flesh. Muscles that would respond viciously if ever he was cornered. His eyes were those of a hunter, light blue and cold, very cold. Too cold for this to be a vacation. My business partner, Richard Dodge, passed away a short time ago. I had him insured to protect my investment. I understand you're investigating the claim. Who sells you your information, Becker? This is a small town race. You sent a wire reporting your arrival to the insurance company. The boy who took the wire has rather a poor sense of ethics. He reads things. What do you want, Becker? What do you want, Race? I might help you to find it quickly and save us both a lot of time. You insured Richard Dodge for $50,000, but you only invested 8000 in the garage he opened. It doesn't add up. I like Dodge. He was a competent mechanic with a good reputation. And according to the medical report when the insurance examination was made, he was a very healthy mechanic with a very good heart. People have been known to take sick quite suddenly. Yeah, well, this is a bit too convenient. Especially with the money involved. Well, I can see you haven't a very trusting nature, Race. I thought I might be helpful. After all, none of us know when the old pump might give out, Race. Could happen to anybody. It might even happen to you. <laughs> In checking around Midville, I found that Richard Dodge, the latest victim of the heart disease racket, had a mother. I went to see her. I can't understand what happened to my boy, Mr. Race. He was so big and strong. He played football when he was in high school, you know. 
Did he have any insurance? Any payable to you, I mean? Well, he, he did before he went into the business with Mr. Becker. But then Richard increased his old policy and made it over to Becker so that the premiums wouldn't cost too much. You mean Richard paid the premiums himself? No, I paid them. I had a little money left over from my husband's pension. I see. I have some pictures of my son in his football uniform and when he was a soldier. Would you like to see them, Mr. Reese? Uh, no, I'd... Yes. Yes, Mrs. Dodge. I'd like to see them. There are some pictures you can't erase from your mind. Richard Dodge had been tall and straight, mean looking. Now there was nothing left for the little old lady who had prayed him safely through a war, only to see him die without reason. I walked back to the hotel. Well, hey, it's about time you got back. It's been a dame looking for you. She said there was something you didn't know, and uh, she thought it might help you. Yeah, that must be this week's target for good deeds. Everybody wants to help me. Did she leave a name? Yeah. She said she was Mrs. Dodge. Didn't mean anything? Mrs. Dodge? Well, I just left the old lady less than half an hour ago. This dame was here a half hour ago. And uh, <laughs> she ain't all... Not with that complexion. She said she'd get down and wait for you in a car. Parked at the end of the driveway. Blue convertible. Yeah, I better see her. Yeah, but I've got something for you to do, too. Here's a list of all the possible victims of the ring. Huh? They all died in this county. The county coroner's right here in Midville. You go over this list with him, will you, and, and find out if he performed an autopsy on any of them, and uh, tell him I'd like a copy of his report in each case. Oh, fine. I get all the nice jobs. All you gotta do is chase after the dolls, but lucky me. I draw the county coroner. Now get going, boy. He may be beautiful. The blue convertible was at the end of the driveway, all right. The girl behind the wheel steered to the highway. I saw her face in the last glow of the sun. It was lovely. Lovely enough to make me forget for a moment why I was here. Finally, she turned into a small country lane and stopped. Got a cigarette? Here. Thanks. You didn't know Richard Dodge was married, did you? That's something I still don't know. We were married secretly more than a year ago. I, uh, you don't want to sound like a house detective, but I suppose you have the license. No, Richard kept. That was an odd choice. Most men keep the bride. Especially when she looks like you, Mrs. Dodge. Call me Ray. Ray. That's an unusual name. Well, not really. It stands for Lorraine. And when I was a child, it was too much to handle all at once. Why did you bring me out here? Not just to tell me that Richard Dodge had a wife. Our marriage was secret. I didn't know what would come out in your investigation. Yes, yeah, safe. His insurance wasn't made out to you. Richard and I never announced our marriage because I was sorry I ever got into it. It wasn't until later that he told me about his heart. Told you what about his heart? He was sick. He was always afraid that he was going to die. The insurance examiner doesn't agree with him. Neither did the doctors in the United States Army. And he could be wrong, couldn't they, Ray? You believe me, don't you? She leaned toward me and her eyes were blue in the dusk. But blue and smoky as a Harlem band at midnight. Her hair brushed the side of my face and her arms went around my neck. A man who gets kissed like that needs a strong heart. I could go very fond of you, Race. If you'd let me. I shouldn't object, should I? After all, you recover quickly. The last man you were fond of has been dead almost two weeks. I told you that Richard was a mistake. Whoever killed him made a mistake, too. You have no right to say he was killed, not unless you have some proof. All right, sir. All right, Race. Well, out of the car, get your hands up. Race, it's a holdup. Save that for the Midville Little Theater, baby. You'll never make Broadway. You keep your lip button, wise guy. Tell the dame to start the car and get out of here. Why don't you tell her? You know her name as well as you knew mine. Go ahead, sister. Beat it. Night had fallen. She had to put her lights on to turn the car on the narrow road. 
My back was to her, and the lights hit the man with the gun square in the face. And I dove at him. I'm turning this gun into your stomach. Why don't you pull the trigger now? Let me pull you. Sure, with pleasure. Oh, Race. Race, I was so frightened. Yeah, you're so sincere. Come on, drive me back to my hotel. Well, what about Carson? Oh. So his name's Carson. Thanks. Let's leave him there. The duel will bring him around. Brother, what happened to you? You got lipstick on your mouth, but the rest of you. What did she do? Kiss you and then push you into a concrete match? Yeah, um, rival popped up. A fellow named Carson. How'd you make up with the car? Huh, fine, fine. We'll kill the whole quart of elderberry wine. <laughs> He makes it himself. How about the death reports? Ah, he says it was all just plain hard failure. Said we was wasting our time. Me too, huh? <laughs> you know, some I think I'm going to turn in early. <laughs> that wine has made me woozy. <laughs> <laughs> You'll probably have me a technical hangover. <laughs> a few minutes ago, everything looked blue, and now <laughs> everything looks yellow. <laughs> Isn't that funny, <laughs> Yeah. Yellow. <laughs> what looks yellow, Mark? Uh, everything. It's funny. Everything. Uh, Mark, light up, boy. You're right here in the couch. Race. What's the matter with me? Your order, please. Uh, tell room service to shoot up some ice and plenty of black coffee right away. And send the house doctor up. Hurry. Race. What is it? I, I feel... Yeah, Mark, Mark you got to be quiet, boy. I'm a... I'm afraid you're going to have a heart attack. You've got about a 50-50 chance to save your life. We'll return to the adventures of Frank Race in just about one minute. Back to the adventures of Frank Race. I stayed at the hotel waiting for the doctor to get finished with Mark. It was touch and go. I knew he was having a rough time of it. But while he was conscious, he never lost that grin. It made me want to go out after Becker and his mom. But you operate off cue when you get like that. I knew better. How is he, doctor? He's sleeping now. I think you came out of it all right. Coffee you poured into him probably saved his life. I was right about the drug then. Yes. An overdose of digitalis. Administered orally. If he'd gotten a bit more of it, nothing would have helped. How did you spot it? We had yellow vision. I know that color distortion's often the result of a heart depressant. Yeah, it could be caused by something else. You made a good guess. No, the nature of the case I'm working on eliminated guesswork in this instance. Uh, I'll have to make out a report, naturally. Uh, do you know who is responsible? Not for sure, but I hope to before long. As soon as I've had a chance to sample some wine. You'd better stick to water if the gentleman you have in mind spiked his wine with digitalis. Uh, speaking of water, I think I'll try some. Perhaps so. There's also some scotch over it. Yeah, thanks, as will do. Mm. What's the matter, Doctor? Miss Water. I thought you said he was given the drug in wine. You mean there's some in that water? Enough to kill a mule, I'd say. I'd better have this analyzed. Yes. I'd better start shopping around for a new suspect. For the next 12 hours, Mark slept like a log. I stayed close to him. The stuff he'd swallowed had obviously been meant for me. Made a few long-distance calls, including one to Fred Jeremy. He came up by plane, loaded with information. Well, I checked with the police, Race. There's a lot of stuff. I hope you can make it fit. How about Becker? Yeah, there's a prison record, all right. He also has an alias. Sometimes calls himself Benjamin Delaney. Benjamin Delaney? Well, that's the name of another of the beneficiaries on a policy he paid off a couple months ago. That's right. Now, how about Carson? You able to run down anything on him? He served time with Delaney. He's also out on parole. Good. Now, um, how about Richard Dodge? Any record of his marriage? Yes. Has he married a girl named Lorraine Gregory? 
A civil ceremony performed in the next county. Lorraine Gregory. The county coroner's name's Gregory. That's right, Race. She's the coroner's daughter. So what were Becker and Carson convicted for? Armed robbery. Oh, yeah. Picked a less spectacular game, but one that's all even more lethal. Race, uh, in view of what happened to your friend, I think we could get the police to make an arrest. No, no, not yet, Fred. Couldn't make it stick. Why not? Because we can't prove access to the drug. It's hard to obtain. We've had every source checked and all prescriptions searched. There's no way they could have gotten their hands on the quantities used. None that we could prove. Hi, fellas. Hey, Mark, come on now. Get back in bed. Ah, oh, not a chance. Don't you know more people die in bed than any place? I'm sorry about what happened to you, Donovan. The company will try to make it up to you. Oh, thanks. But I am interested in how you could have made it up to me if I drank just a little more of that stuff. <laughs> I guess you're getting better, all right. <laughs> I have been slip Mickey's before, you know. But this one was meant to be permanent. I would like to get my hands on the gent who's prepared it. I hope you'll get that chance. I'm going on. Uh-uh. I bet there's another dame in this. Yes and no. I'm in the mood for a little elderberry wine. I'm going to visit Coroner Gregory and his daughter. Well, hello. Hello yourself. Is your father home? Come to ask for my hand, please. When I ask for your hand, baby, I'll be carrying handcuffs in mine. Who's out there, Rain? A man named Race. He wants to see Father. Well, bring him in, girl. Enter, Mr. Race. Mother, Dad, this is Mr. Race. Mm -mm. I'd like to talk to the coroner officially and alone. Well, I can always wash my hair. But you'll find that Mother and Dad are hard to separate. You may leave us, Margaret. I'll stay right here. You had too much wine to be left by yourself. You mean he might say things I shouldn't hear? What I mean is my business. Gregory, you uh, almost had another heart failure case in your hands. A friend of mine. That's so. If he had died, your report might have been interesting. I wonder what it would have said. Since he ain't dead, there's no way of telling. I think he'd have passed it off as a natural death, just as you have in so many other cases. Heart trouble is a common disease. Yes, but... Not when it's caused by digitalis. Why didn't you do an autopsy on Richard Dodge? I know how to run my job. Well, it might not be a job for much longer. I'm going to ask the state's attorney to appoint a grand jury to investigate these deaths. Go ahead. You ain't getting me out of this job. Margaret will see to that, won't you? Shut up. Why should I? These city fellas are so smart. We don't like outsiders around here, mister. You can't like your own people too well, either. They're dying off too easily. On that cue, I left. I'd uncovered one small point. Wherever Gregory's local political strength came from, it came through his wife. I checked around and found that he'd held some minor political office or other for years. But the key was Margaret Gregory. And it wasn't long before I could fit her into the jigsaw. I went back to Fred Jeremy and Mark. Well, what's the answer, Race? Who tried to do away with me? Well, we're getting close. The coroner? Only part of a setup. I know now why Becker and Carson and probably quite a few others are wandering around loose. They were paroled. Yes, but they shouldn't have been. Not if the parole board had been given the full facts. But who could hide the facts? Only one person. The secretary who prepared the reports. And when they were released, that secretary happened to be the coroner's wife, Margaret Gregory. Well, that ties it up, doesn't it, Race? All but the digitalis. But I think that I know where that comes from. Well, it must have come from someplace. They got gallons of it. Well, there was a third man in that holdup with Becker and Carson. A man named Otto Rodman. Yes, but Rodman was never paroled. It was his third offense, and he got a stiff sentence. He has another ten years to serve on a fifteen-year rap. Yes, but he's behaved himself very well for the past five years. He's a trustee at the prison. Yeah, so what's that got to do with a digit... Digitalis, Mark. <laughs> That's what I said. I think Rodman supplies it. Because for the past fourteen months, as a trustee... He's been assigned to the prison hospital. Yeah, that's rough, Race. Things get around quick on a prison grapevine. If we went in to investigate, he'd know it before we got to him. Well, not the way we're going to do it, Fred. I'm going to set it up with the state's attorney. Mark and I are going into that state prison as a pair of convicted hijackers. <laughs> Now, 
which two go to the infirmary? Yeah. We do. We do. Uh, uh, get in there. Uh, here are two guys for sick call, Rodman. Probably faking. I'll see him on the way back after the doctor gets in. Okay, Mr. Seward. What are you guys in for? Uh, the cops say we hijacked a truck. Yeah, but of course you didn't. Well, of course not. Yeah. Ain't it a shame the way we innocent guys keep getting thrown in here for nothing? It was a frame-up. Yeah. What are you in for? I borrowed some money and forgot to give it back. You guys really sick or just stolen? Yeah, my uh, heart's been giving me a little trouble. I guess being in this place brings on heart attacks. Nah, you get used to it. We ain't had more than four heart cases in a year. I've been on this job. How do you get an assignment like this? Keeping my nose clean. Is this better than the other spots? Yeah, grub's better. A few special privileges. Private room visitors three days a week. Does it work hard? No. Nah. Guys got to be pretty sick before they let him stay in here. Mostly it's a clerk's job, keeping records, ordering supplies. Hmm. Those books are uh, right there beside you. Hmm. That looks pretty simple. Aspirin, bandages, coating, and digitalis. Quite a lot of digitalis. A large order every month, yet you've only had four heart cases in more than a year. Well, the, the stuff spoils the stamp here. Yeah, you got to make sure it's fresh. Besides, you better put that book down before the doc gets here. Uh, get over and sit on that bench. Robin, you've been slipping that digitalis out of here a hundred grains a month to Becker and Carson. Y you're crazy. You're nuts, both of you. Watch him, Race. Uh, what are you, a couple of stupid? Rodman, you're an accessory to more than 20 murders, and you'll die for it unless you get smart. Die? Will I? Put on that scalpel, Rodman. Uh, put it in your heart. Look out, Race. Look out. Stay back, Mark. This thing is sharper than a razor. Can you take it? I'll kill you and... Drop it. Drop it. You lose, Rodman. There's an electric chair in this setup someplace. Who's going to sit in it? You or Becker and Carson and the Gregorys? Uh, all right. All right, I'll talk. Save it. I'd like the warden and a couple other people to hear it. Open up. God. <laughs> hey, you know something, Race? I'll bet we're saving the shortest sentence anybody ever saved here. Well, Race, can you think of any reason why we should pay your fee after treating you to such a fine vacation? A vacation? Are you kidding? I almost become a corpus delicious. <laughs> oh, oh. Mark, Latin, and you do not make a team. <laughs> Fred's good. <kidding. laughs> I certainly am. <laughs> what a ring. The coroner and his wife and daughter and a pair of cutthroats. Hey, you know something, Race? That rain thing wasn't bad looking. I, I don't think she was so bad. Man, maybe her family just roped her into it, huh? She working on your heart for the second time? What do you mean the second time? Who do you think poured that stuff into your drinking water? You, you mean she did it? Why that two time and no good thing? <laughs> 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 that would have uh, gone on if you hadn't stopped it, Race. You saved the company a lot of money. I uh, wanted to talk to you about that, Fred. You never paid Becker for the death of Richard Dodge, did you? No, no, and uh, we won't have to now. Well, those premiums were paid by Dodge's mother, Fred. Sweet old lady. She's the real victim of this. Oh, I see what you're driving at, Race. I think I can arrange to have the claim paid to her. Ah, oh, thanks, Fred. You're a decent guy. <laughs> The Adventures of Frank Race, starring Tom Collins with Tony Barrett as Mark Donovan, comes to you from Hollywood. Others heard in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Michael Ann Barrett, Jack Crucian, Ted Von Elts, and Wilms Herbert. This series is written and directed by Buckley Angel and Joel Murcott. The music is composed and played by Ivan Dittmars. Be sure to be with us again this same time next week for another dramatic chapter in The Adventures of Frank Race. Art Gilmore speaking. This is a Bruce Ells production. The Adventures of Frank Race, starring Tom Collins. The 
war changed many things, the face of the earth and the people on it. Before the war, Frank Race worked as an attorney, but he traded his law books for the cloak and dagger of the OSS. And when it was over, his former life was over too. Adventure had become his business. The Adventures of Frank Race. And now we join Frank Race for The Adventure of the Garrulous Bartender. There's something about having a date with a redhead that causes a man to spend an extra five minutes with his razor, take a little more time in choosing a tie, and maybe giving himself a last look in the mirror just before he's ready to go. Which is just what I was doing when... Hey, I was wondering if you'd be here. I've been trying to get hold of you all... My, 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 don't the man look pretty. <laughs> Big night, Marcus. I'm dining with that delicious lass with the Titian tresses who... Uh... Who is third from the left in the chorus that legs at Mike Shannon's floor show. Exactly. And now you may congratulate me. And now I am going to break your heart. Mr. Daniel Poulsen at the Pacific Insurance Company wants he should see you, but bad and but right away. Look, Mark, I'm willing to forget you ever gave me this news. Breaking this date tonight would make me very unhappy. Yeah, huh? Mr. Poulsen is already unhappy. He told me so three times, all the way from Los Angeles. You mean Poulsen's been calling from California? Yeah, which costs more than a nickel a throw. He's a big account, any rate. Yep. Here goes my red head. What did Poulsen say? He's at the Biltmore Hotel out there, which I understand is a fair to Midland manger. And he claims he wants to see you the first thing in the morning. He told me that at 3 o'clock this afternoon. It is now 8.30. All right. Let's go. Los Angeles was having one of those days her Chamber of Commerce doesn't like to discuss. Cloudy. And the weather matched the expression of Dan Polson as he greeted me in his suite at Biltmore. I'm glad you got here. You've got to move fast on this thing. What is it? An embezzlement job. Hundred thousand dollars, and you know what that means. We don't crack it, there'll be a hundred more of them all over the country. It must be a bank job. It is. A man by the name of Thomas Carney. Manager of the Spring Street branch of the Merchants National Bank. Any leads? And just two. They're both pretty slim. He had recently been frequenting a bar on Main Street, a spot called Crow's Nest. Mm -hmm. And in his apartment, the police came across an envelope postmarked Juarez, Mexico. Had no return address. There was nothing inside it. No, oh, that's nothing. I guess my first move was a visit to this place called the Crow's Nest. Skid Row with music. That's Main Street, Los Angeles. Here you'll find plenty of drifters. The lads that don't seem to have a knack for what's known as making a living... But the barkeep at the crow's nest looked affluent enough. He had a pendulous paunch, cheeks that could have doubled for dewlaps, and a pair of pop eyes that indicated thyroid trouble. Uh, sure, I know Connie. Not a bad guy. <laughs> Never can tell, can you? You ever hear him say he'd been in Juarez? Juarez? <laughs> you know, I think he did say something like that once. Hey, but why? I'd like to talk to him. I thought he might be there. Oh, kid yourself, mister. You ain't got a chance of talking to Connie. Yeah, he might want to talk to me. Might even have changed his mind about... Keeping that money. Hundred thousand bucks? <laughs> yeah, why would a guy want to change his mind about a hundred thousand bucks? Because he finds that he's afraid of what he's done. Because he finds that if he had it to do over, he wouldn't. Yeah, well, you got something there. Uh, come to think of it, Connie was kind of scared, little guy. Uh, might change his mind at that if you could put it to him that way. What way, Danny? Remember the kid you knew in school who enjoyed pulling the wings off live flies? Well, he was one growing up. He looked as though he might have just. Stepped out of his web. And the bartender's reaction made you think of the flies. Oh, uh, uh, hello, Zucker. What way, Benny? Oh, I, I was just saying, I bet Connie's having a good time in Juarez. Uh, uh, no, uh, uh, Tijuana, maybe. You talk too much, you know that, Benny? Sure, sure. I, I talk too much, Zucker. But, but I don't mean nothing by it. I should talk too much, don't hang around very long. You don't know that, Benny. Sure, sure. I, I know it. <laughs> Excuse me, Zucker, I got a customer. <laughs> You heard my name, pal. What's yours? Race. You're a cop, aren't you? 
Not exactly. I hate cops. Now, just to keep the record straight, I'm an insurance investigator. It's all the same. You're a cop. Which adds up to what? You're gonna head right for Juarez, ain't you? It's because that flab mouth said Connie might be there. I might head for Juarez. You're gonna head right for Juarez just because that little flab mouth likes to jabber. And Benny... Uh, well, what do you want, Zucker? Come in. Oh, look, Zucker, I, I told you, I didn't mean nothing. I said come in. Well, 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 what do you want, Zucker? A uh, drink, eh? Lean over here. What for? So I can take hold of you. Like this? Let go, let go. You fat flat mouth, I'm gonna... Let go of him. Get your hands off me. If you don't let go of him, I'm gonna break your arm. All right. I'll let him go. Big guy, ain't you? Tough, hard, big guy. Why don't you drift? You know what I'm going to do with you, big guy? I'm going to be around. I'm going to be around all the time. You stay here, I stay here. You go to Juarez, I go to Juarez. All the time till I get you somewhere just right. Then I'm going to make you wish you'd never been born. Hey, that character wasn't kidding, Race. He's a bad one. We've had bad ones before. Uh, sure. He always made a play and we took care of him. This guy's going to hang back. That ain't good. But I got an idea. Why don't we go to work on him first? Well, it's probably a good idea. Fairly sound. But it isn't the way we operate, is it? Ah, ethics. What good are ethics? Me, I'll take an end wrench any time. Yeah. What do you make of this setup, anyway? A little bank manager rubs shoulders with the underworld. And lets himself get talked into a bezel in a hundred grand. <laughs> You'd be lucky if you let him keep a nickel of it. That's a pretty sound observation. Know anything about war is, Mark? I was there during the war. It's the toughest town on the North American continent. Well, war is is where we're going, as of now. The toughest town on the North American continent looked sleepy, felt unbearably hot, and gave you the feeling that here had been gathered all the dust in the world. It was just after noon, siesta time. But I ran into one native who seemed willing to give his time to something else besides slumber. You better come in from that sun, senor, before it burns a hole in your head. That's probably an excellent suggestion. Uh, you were looking for something, senor. My name is Enrique Hernandez. I like to help people look for things. I'm looking for Americans. Oh, we got a few here. <laughs> How do you like them? Like, like this or <laughs> like this? I'm looking for a man. A man by the name of Carney. Carney, a little man with a part of his hair gone. That adds up. Can you take me to him? <laughs> he would be worth something, senor. A hundred dollars if I get right to him. See, si, this evening, senor, I'm going to meet you here. You have a hundred dollars in your hand, and I will show you the way to this man, Carney. I had sent Mark Donovan looking for information. I found him seated at a table in the bar of our so-called hotel, sipping drinks with three people who were obviously Americans. There was a man and two women. Mark saw me as I came in, excused himself, and came over to me. Hey, have any luck, Race? No, a little. He looks like you're doing all right. Yeah. I kind of stumble into this. <laughs> See the two dames? Well, I make a play for the young one, and the old one gets the idea I mean her. <laughs> Well, look up, it. she didn't exactly slap your face. Yeah, not Emma. In 15 minutes, I am the thrill of her life. Nah, may not be important, but they're a lot of fun. Come on over, I'll introduce you. Mark introduced the man at the table as Jack Kemp. The women as Peggy Dana and Emma Telepher. Kemp must have been about 30. Nice-looking person with a pleasant manner. Peggy Dana reminded me of a girl I'd once fallen for in high school. She wore slacks and a sweater, and I felt I could do the falling all over again. Emma Tulliver was wearing slacks, too. And she shouldn't have been. A red splash of bandana had been tied around her head and face that would have looked better in a 
football helmet. Suppose you're wondering what we're doing down here, Mr. Ace. <laughs> Matter of fact, I'm wondering myself. What are we doing, Peggy? Why, darling, you said you wanted to do something different, something exciting. Didn't she, Jack? That's the way I heard it. As Margaret said, it wasn't important, but it was fun. So much so, I remembered my appointment with Enrique Hernandez just in time. I made my excuses and left Mark behind, went out to find Enrique waiting impatiently. He had me follow him to an alley that led to what appeared to be an abandoned cafe. Which you are, senor. A naughty hundred dollars, please. After I've seen my man. Where is he? You just open the door, senor. Where'd you see a light? You're going to find him inside? All right. I find him, then you get your hundred. Who's that? The man on the other side of the room was staring at me with a cool, clear, all-seeing gaze of a drunk peering through a wet window. But he wasn't drunk. He was frightened. Little and bald-headed and frightened. Didn't you hear me? I said, who is it? Someone who wants to talk to him. Who are you? I don't know you. If you let me, I'm going to help you. I don't need any help. Help me? How? I can make it possible for you to go back to the States. I don't want to go back to the States. Yeah. How? How would you make it possible? I can arrange a deal. What kind of a deal? You turn back the money you embezzled, and I think I can get you off with a light sentence. No. No, I couldn't do that. You'd rather sweat it out like this, would you? Terror stricken, wondering what's going to happen next. I know. I know, but I couldn't return the money now. They wouldn't let me. Who wouldn't let you? <laughs> Never mind. I can't say. You'd rather keep eating your heart out, would you? All I have to do is telegraph. We'd get a reply back in a matter of hours. A light sentence, Connie. Then you're free again. I don't know. I don't know. I could see I had him going. So I kept talking. Until he finally gave in. I was to wire Los Angeles. If the deal could be made, if he could get off with a light sentence, he was willing to turn over the money. I left him and found a telegraph office. But it wasn't until the next morning that I got my reply. Then I went back to see him. Connie, you here? Yeah, he's here, Ray. Why don't you shut the door? It was Zucker, looking as though he just pulled a wing off of one of those flies. He was sitting in a rocking chair, rocking gently. Sit down. Or uh, are you afraid you'd get your clothes dirty? Where's Connie? He's here, in the other room. Go take a look. I will. Connie was sitting in a chair, too, and it happened to be another rocker. But Connie wasn't rocking. Someone had beaten the life out of him with a blunt and heavy instrument. We'll return to the adventures of Frank Race in just about one minute. Now, back to the adventures of Frank Race. It had all seemed so pat. My scared fugitive with his $100,000 hidden away somewhere, and I'd needed only a talk with him to break the case. So I had been telling myself, or should I say kidding myself, when a man has no breath in him, he does no talking. And this was now the permanent condition of Thomas Carney, embezzler. I turned back to Zucker to find he'd been joined by a couple of dubious-looking companions. Kind of a mess, ain't he? Connie? Yeah, he's a mess, all right. Somebody must have really had a grudge against that boy. Somebody who wanted that money he was carrying. Yeah, that's the way I figure it, too. You didn't want it, of course. Me? I was Connie's pal. That's right. You were his protector, weren't you? So you let someone murder him. Go ahead. Needle me. See what it gets you. Of course, you weren't with him when it happened. That's right, I wasn't with him. Or it wouldn't have happened. Not right now, anyway. But somebody was with him. It might have been you. Sure, yeah, that's the way I make my living. By murdering the one man who can break the case for me. Well, it's been done before. That's right, you don't like cops, do you? You don't think they're honest. That's right. I don't think they're honest. I told you I wasn't a cop. 
Tell the cop, all right. I suppose you've been looking for that money. I hate cops. If you had the money, you wouldn't be here. And you wouldn't have killed Carney unless he was sure of the money. So that lets you out. I'm much obliged. But it don't let you out. No? No. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to tease you. Tease you till you tell us a story on that dough. You're overlooking something, aren't you? Yeah? What? Would I have come back here if I already had the money? How do I know? How do I know what a cop's liable to do? You want we should start in on him now, Zuka? No, no, not here. We might want to work on this boy for quite a while. We wouldn't want them Juarez police to butt in. So I take him to the motel, eh? No, you take him out in the sticks. Out in the sand where we went yesterday. You keep him in the sun while you work on him. Uh, that's going to get a little hot. For you? <laughs> sure. But think how hot it's going to get for him. You ain't coming? No, not right now. I want to have a look around this joint. I'll catch up with you later. A pair of assistants took me outside to a car they had waiting at the end of the alley. I was pushed into the back seat, but uh, it didn't start moving. The car just wouldn't cooperate. It sounds like you boys might be a little low on gas. Uh, then you put no push in this crate. No, you're dead. Look at the gauge, you jerk. Well, uh, let's go back and tell Zucker. He'll probably be quite happy with the efficiency shown by you boys. I ain't going to tell Zucker nothing about it. There's a gas station a couple of blocks from here. We'll go get some. All right, come on, get out. Oh, you uh, want me along too, huh? Yeah, I thought maybe you'd let me sit here and watch the passes by. Quit clowning. Get out. It was more than two blocks. It was five. All of them dusty, all of them hot. And my companions weren't used to walking. That quickly became obvious. So by the time we reached the gas station, both were thoroughly disgruntled with me, with the weather, and with each other. Then we had to wait. And what goes on around here anyway? Ain't there nobody to run this joint? It was one o'clock, siesta time. Ah, oh, damn it, no wonder they never get nothing done around here. Well, here's a can. We can uh, just take some gas, leave the money. We'll take some gas, all right, but we ain't leaving nothing. Here, I'll fill it for you. <sighs> okay, where do you want it? In a can, you creep. Where else? Well, I was thinking a good spot might be your face. <laughs> I let them both have it right in the teeth. Then I dropped the thing and ran. I didn't slow up until I felt purple and reasonably assured that I'd lost them. It was then that a familiar voice spoke to me. You better come in from that sun, senor. It's not good for running like that. Uh, oh, it's you, Hernandez. And you're so right. Only an idiot would run in heat like this. See, si, see. Si. You had not forget my hundred dollars, have you, senor? No, Enrique, I, I have not forgot. Yeah. Oh, gracias, senor. Muchas gracias. I was a little surprised you weren't waiting for me when I came out of that place last night. I would have waited, senor, but... I was afraid. While you were in that place, there was someone else who came. Someone else? Who? Hmm? Oh, what they look like? I could only hear, senor. It was too dark to see. But they stood outside while you were there, and uh, the, that hundred dollars, it was for telling about Garney, not for fighting about him. <laughs> <laughs> you have sound logic, Enrique. <laughs> To carry you a long way. Is there anything else for which the senor would like to employ me? There may be, Enrique. We'll see. I was hot and thirsty, and full of the conviction that I had bungled what appeared to be a fairly simple case. A combination of circumstances that called for a drink. A long, tall, cool one that I secured at the bar of our hotel... And while I quaffed it, something feminine and lovely sidled under the stool next to me. Something feminine and lovely by the name of Peggy Dana. Hello, Reyes. Hello, yourself. You look as though you'd been running. I have, but uh, we won't talk about that. What would you like? I didn't stop for a drink. I just thought I'd like to talk to you. Oh. Had I known that was coming up, I'd have gone downstairs and prettied up a little. Oh, you look all right as you are. You look all right, too. You look awfully all right. 
Race, why are you down here? Hasn't Mike Donovan told you? You know he hasn't. He's not the type. What are you doing down here? I just came down for a look at the place. I'd heard it was wild and woolly. But now I guess I'm just staying because you're here. But you've been keeping so busy. What about the boyfriend, Jack Kemp? Yes, what about me, Peggy? I thought I was in your good books. <laughs> I think you're wonderful, darling. See, Race, the girl really loves me. <laughs> so quit trying to steal her, will you? Um, look, uh, why don't we go to a table where we can start some serious drinking? Hmm? Oh, Jack, it's too hot. Mm, not for me. How about you, Race? I don't think I could handle another one. Good man. Uh, now, uh, I'd like to make you bet. Just finish one more of those things you're sipping now. And I'll give you any odds you want that it's the beginning of your downfall. He was almost right. A hot day and a bartender who knew how to hide dynamite in a cool, delicious drink. That's enough to cause your grandmother's downfall. But the fourth one, I knew I'd have to slow up. But it didn't seem to bother Kemp. The only way he showed any effect was by insisting on paying for every round. And by the careful and exact way he counted out the bills to pay for them. I was finally rescued by Mark, who somehow got me up to our room. Are you off your rocker? You can't drink like that in this country. Or in any other. What do you want? Hot coffee, cold shower, or both? I don't want either, Mark. Be quite truthful. I just want to go out and send another wire to Los Angeles. Oh, you nuts. Here, just let me ease you down on this bed now. Ease down on yourself, boy. I'm going out and send that wire. I just thought of something I think is going to crack this case. <laughs> Yeah. It's almost midnight. What have you been doing? Playing watchdog. Did I get a wire from Los Angeles? Yeah, here it is. Good. Well, so what you want? Right on the button. Oh. Come on, Mark. Yeah. So now what? We're going to have a look at a room three doors down the hall. Is there anyone in the room? No, no. Now, here we are. Right. Key and everything, huh? Yeah, I um, got friendly with the night clerk. Made him alone. He doesn't have to pay back. Look, tell me, what are we looking for? A hundred thousand dollars. Or most of it, anyway. Oh, brother, a hundred grand. <laughs> Listen, if we find that, you're going to have to worry about me. But what makes you think it might be here? Because this is the room of the... Hey, what is this? Good evening, Mr. Camp. Hey, race what goes. You ain't tagging Jack for this deal, are you? Jack's a nice guy. Uh, Camp... Just seems to be a nice guy, Mark. He also seems to be a wealthy playboy, but he isn't. He's a bank teller who followed Carney down here and murdered him. What? You drank too much today, Race. A bank teller? Oh, I think you're missing on this one, Race. Jack just ain't the type. Yeah, but he acts the type in one very peculiar way. What are you talking about? I'm talking about the way you counted out the money this afternoon when you were paying for those drinks. Meticulously. Carefully. You laid out each bill with just the proper snap of your thumb. Just the way you've been doing it for 11 years at the Merchants National on Spring Street in Los Angeles. Start looking for that money, Mark. Right. The bank has nothing on me. I quit legitimately without touching a dime. So they said. But you knew about Carney. He'd been foolish enough to confide in you a little, shall we say? You know, he was going to a rendezvous down here with thugs he thought were going to protect him. So you came here, too, and got to the money before they could. But you had to murder him to make it stick. Hey, Ray, here's the dough. It was in his phone book. And you can turn it all over to me. Thanks for leaving the door open, boy. It's a written invitation. It still opens, okay? For you to back out. I ain't backing out of nothing. Come on, chum. Bring me that phone book. You can still leave, okay? But not with that phone book. Like I told you before, Race, I don't like cops. You crowd me too far, and I'll prove it to you. Bring me the phone book, chum. That gun he's got in his hand, Race. That's a good argument. I've got a gun in my hand, too, Mark. In my pocket. But, uh, maybe you had better give him the phone book. Oh. All right. I'll give it on. Hey, you did have a rod in your pocket. That's right. But sometimes when you can't afford to bluff... And this was one of them. The Adventures of Frank Race, starring Tom Cox.
Collins with Tony Barrett as Mark Donovan comes to you from Hollywood. Others heard in tonight's cast were Michael Ann Barrett, D.J. Thompson, Wilms Herbert, Tom Holland, and Jack Crucian. This series is written and directed by Buckley Angel and Joel Murcott. The music is composed and played by Ivan Dittmars. Be sure to be with us again this same time next week for another dramatic chapter in The Adventures of Frank Race. Art Gilmore speaking. This is a Bruce Ells production. Well, Hearth and Homies, I hope you enjoyed The Adventures of Frank Grace. This was a good compilation. I'm looking forward to uh, hearing more of these shows. We'll be working on another compilation of Frank Grace very soon. And of course, I'm here at the end of the show like the old time announcers, but I'm not going to talk about Petri Wine, not going to talk about Anchor Hawking, not going to talk about Life Boy or Lux Soap, and I'm definitely not going to try to sell you some giant inflatable animals, including a creepy clown. Nope, just gonna tell you about the Johnny Dollar Club. This channel is not monetized by YouTube currently, but we're totally dependent on viewers like you to help us out because it does take time and money to run a channel like this. That's where the Johnny Dollar Club, ah, that's where the Johnny Dollar Club comes in. For only a dollar a month, you can support the channel and you'll also get access to exclusive content. So click the links below. You can use either Patreon or Buy Me A Coffee to join the club. You'll get access to some great content. Then take a moment to check out some of the higher tiers. You also have the opportunity to get some perks from those. Now, as the support grows for the channel, I'll be able to put more shows up and also be able to offer more exclusive content. So thanks so much for checking it out. And thanks so much if you're already supporting the channel. So many of you have been so gracious and headed over there and you send such nice messages and let us know that uh, supporting the channel. Some of you go over to Buy Me A Coffee and have bought us strawberries. <laughs> And Ellie really appreciates the strawberries. Well, anyway, thanks so much for joining us for tonight's show. And we hope to see you in the next one. You going to the cookie store? We're going. So hey, what, hey, hey. what are you going to get at the store? Strawberry. Do you like strawberries? We're strawberries. Hey, we're interviewing. Hey, today we have a special guest. We've got Elia. And Elia. Hi. Oh, okay. Hey, before you go, do you like strawberries? This. You like them? Sorry, please. <laughs> Are you a bumblebee? Dead. Well, thanks for joining us today, Ellie, and stinging me. So. Uh, ow! You off to the store to get some strawberries? Yes! Yeah? I get to go! Okay, go to the car. You can see. Bye bye. <laughs> Blow a kiss. Say bye bye. No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> On the keys. Hey, give me my keys.